So, hello everyone. Welcome to another subspecialty VMR. Today we have in, uh, infectious diseases together with Dr. Lila Wu Colburn. And uh, before introducing her, I mean, no, I will start the introduction and mentioning something about her before I will lead the mic to Dr. Lila. So, um, Dr. Lila Wu Colburn is an professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Emory University Hospital of Medicine in at Atlanta, and she's a renowned medical educator and has a wide range of clinical interests, including tropical medicine, HIV, and fungal diseases. And now I will lead the mic to Dr. Lila to tell us um, what she likes to do outside of medicine and why you choose um, in, uh, infect, infectual... I forgot how to pronounce it. I give the mic to you. It's all right, no problem. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome to another uh, virtual morning report. Some places are already in the morning. Other places are about to go to sleep. Um, I'm, I'm Dr. Lila Wachover, and uh, as, as they said, I'm here at Emory. Uh, here. And so what do I like? So if you guys follow me on Twitter, uh, you'll see that I'm a traveler and a foodie and a runner. So I do runcation. So I try to do my vacations and go running. My preferred distance is a uh, half marathon. So 21K uh, for those on the metric system and for those in the imperial system is 13.1 miles. Um, so I just recently did one in, in Guatemala about uh, actually a week ago. Uh, was not the best, but it's all about the ride. So, um, and then I, I post pictures on, on my, on my um, Twitter about that. And then um, what else do I do? I try to do diversity and inclusion in leadership and um, empower women. And for those in the United States, this is Women in Medicine Month. Thank you so much for this great introdu introduction, Dr. Lila. I also have to say that um, I'm a huge fan um, of, uh, of listening to your podcast always. Um, I have to say like infectious diseases, um, I was never good at it, but uh, listening to you, it makes always so much sense to, to see how um, you always framework um, everything. Like I remember the great um, podcast about, it was ring and hand lesions and I can just recommend it to everyone. <laughs> so I will now also lead the mic to our great scribe, Deborah, and then to our amazing uh, Mukun, who's doing teaching points, also to let them introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Deborah. Uh, I will help today with describing, and I'm a med student. And outside of medicine, I like to run too. I love sports. So I'm a sports fan, like running, bicycle, bike, and swimming, CrossFit, everything. So that's one thing that I really like to do. Hi everyone, I'm Mukun. Uh, I'm also a med student, second year in, in California. Uh, and outside of medicine, I'm really interested in astronomy. So all things space related and telescopes involved. Okay, then I think that everyone is ready. Then I would ask Deborah, please um, share her screen so that we can start with the case. Okay, awesome. Um, just a moment. So um, just starting with the first aliquot. So the case that I'm going to present is from the Journal of Infectious Diseases and Epidemiology um, from um, Carden Cardenas et al. from 2020. And um, for the first aliquot, we have the chief complaint of a 53-year-old Hispanic male um, who is in South Florida, USA, um, and he's presenting with acute onset of shortness of breath, fever, and diarrhea. And now also giving you a little bit more about the HPI. So um, he's a 53-year-old otherwise healthy Hispanic male from Colombia, and he arrived at the emergency department presenting with a three-day history of progressive shortness of breath, non-productive cough, subjective fever, nausea, vomiting, and watery diarrhea. And he was initially treated at another center with amoxicillin um, uh, clavul uh, clavulinate, and, but it didn't show any improvement. 
And I would stop here and would like to um, listen to Dr. Lila, what she has to say. Yes, and thank you so much. Um, so we have, so from, from my gather is a uh, healthy 53 uh, year old. Uh, I just, the one thing that I needed to clarify is from Colombia, meaning that he just arrived from Colombia or he's originally from Colombia? Um, he is originally from Colombia, but he's already living in um, South Florida. Okay. And do you know how long he's lived in South Florida? I um, unfortunately know. Okay. That, that's okay. So the reason I, I, I asked if he recently arrived versus someone living is that our differential diagnosis for fever and shortness of breath on a traveler, so someone returning from travel is very different from someone on shortness and breath and fever who's been living here in the United States. So, so that's why I wanted to clarify if the, the patient had just arrived or is someone who has been here. Okay. So uh, interestingly, it is, it's an acute uh, illness. It's, they told us that it's three days. Um, we know that it has a syndrome and has a fever, which is uh, subjective. We don't know how high or how low this fever is um, with shortness of breath and some GI symptoms. So it has nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And had previously taken some antibiotics, which amongst clav can give you diarrhea. But <laughs> So I, I would break it down on things that are common. So shortness of breath with fever and GI symptoms, I would do bacterial versus viral and less likely parasitic unless it's some, somewhere of travel. So when we look at bacterial, things that I always think about shortness of breath and fever is that is something coming from the lungs, something that is making me not take a deep breath. And it's, even though you have a non-productive cough, there is a cough, but it, nothing's coming up. And so um, I think of bacteria that can actually give you nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And the first one that you should think about is uh, Legionella. And interestingly enough, this is like a parenthesis because in Argentina, they just, uh, this mysterious illness that hit uh, in, in Tucumán, uh, the health workers was Legionella. So then after that, you can have things that can, you know, kind of enteric. So uh, Salmonella, which is a great mimicker. So uh, typhoid fever can do that, but not not presenting. Uh, e. coli, um, you know, Klebsiella, it's another one that could do that, um, that could give you um, um, nausea and vomiting. Things that like, for example, strep pneumo, um, staph, and, and things is less likely, but it should always be on the differential anyways. The only thing that goes against it is that they had been treated with amoxicillin, and this is very good against strep. Um, so that's the other part. So those would be my kind of bacterials I would have put there. Um, staph, you can, um, like staph can give you um, an endotoxin. So it can give you kind of nausea and vomiting. And if you spread it into the blood, you can have a bacteremia and that can give you a sepsis-like symptom. So, you know, we always respect the staph. So that should be there. And then you have viral. Uh, so it's a still an acute small syndrome. Um, it's three days. So things that give you a shortness of breath, fever, and diarrhea, you have to think about norovirus. So one of the characteristics of norovirus is a propelling um, uh, uh, vomiting. So you kind of propel, but you have a lot of diarrhea. Campylobacter can do the same thing if it's, uh, it's a secretory. And um, then things a little more, you know, if you want to put parasitic just because you said he was from Colombia, you can always put amebiasis. Uh, if he hasn't traveled, you know, recently, you can have diarrhea, nausea, and you can have like an uh, hepatic um, uh, empyema uh, from, from amoebas. That's, that would be kind of your more zebra-like diagnosis since he's just coming from there. So that's how I would put it so far and then go from there. Thank you so much for this amazing discussion. I really love listening to it. I would now give you more information. So um, for the second aliquot, um, he has a past medical history, a past medical history um, with diverticulosis and a poly, uh, polypectomy three years prior. 
and um, to the family history, um, the patient is married and um, sexually active with a male partner. And to the health-related behaviors, um, he reports uh, occasional marijuana, marijuana use, but um, he says that he doesn't have any contact to pets and there was no recent travel. And I would also give something about the physical examination. Um, so on admission, um, he was uh, remarkable for um, a heart rate of 135. Um, his temperature was 102.7 degree Fahrenheit, and the pulse oximetry was 95% on room air. Unfortunately, I don't have the blood pressure. Um, also for um, the pulmonary, there were a bilateral decrease um, in breath sounds, and in the abdomen, there was mild tenderness to deep palpation in the left lower quadrant and there was no guarding or rebound. Yeah, and I would stop here. Okay, so you gave me a little bit, you know, a little bit more information. So remember when we, you know, look at our, you know, as, as you guys know that I like to talk about how we approach our patients um, with kind of a four-step approach. So we look at the host, we look at what's going on, with the you know the host age immune status conditions and everything so here we you know he's 53 kind of healthy but you gave me a clue of that might help me in infectious disease um that his msm because you said that he was he, he so um and things that i usually ask is if if they're hiv positive if they're on prep um, if they had had um, part of the uh, past medical history, also if they have had STI, so sexually transmitted infections. And then when I talk about sex, I, I ask them if they're the top or the bottom, anal, uh, anal or, or oral sex, um, condom use, things like that. So that, that will help me kind of give me more about the host and kind of know that, okay? Then, you know, we already talked about the syndrome, so shortness of breath, fever, not, and the GI symptoms, which are mainly manifested with the diarrhea. And, you know, we have this watery diarrhea. Um, I didn't hear was bloody. Uh, I didn't hear if there was any tenesmus. Um, does have some abdominal pain, but that was not said during the, the history. Um, the other thing is, does, um, um, so water is so bloody. Uh, it doesn't say how many bowel movements throughout the day. So that's kind of important to know in the watery diarrhea. So the reason we want to know is that if you have 10 bowel movements, that is probably more coming from your lower intestine because the lower intestine is not absorbing the water and it's just kind of flushing through. And then you have, and then you have like if it's small amount of parts, it's more colonic, you know, and, and you can have ulcerations and things like that. So if we have, you know, if we look at a differential diagnosis with fever, dyspnea, fever, and GI, I would add to that that this is an, an MSM um, host. And the reason I want to add that is because in we've seen emergent infectious diseases in MSM. Um, so one of this is called enteric. So just like what we talked about, you know, E. coli, Salmonella, can't be another one that you can put there is uh, Shigella. Um, that can give you those mimic the same thing. Um, for parasitic that we see in our MSM populations are. Uh, Campy, noral, uh, cryptosporidium, and um, um, a microsporidium that you can see. So that that would be. So I, you know, one the, describing a little bit better the type of diarrhea, how many bowel movements, things like that. That would also help me know if the patient is dehydrated or not. If we move to to the vitals, um, patient is what we call, you know, I, was there blood pressure or no blood pressure? Unfortunately, there was no blood pressure. 
Oh, okay. Well, so so let's say he's ninety over sixty with this. It tells me that the you know he and then you tell me that he eyes are sunken, your your skin is tinting, um, that he's probably dehydrated, and, and after hydration, these numbers get better. Um, that's one way of knowing the type of volume. If not, this is a patient who is starting to have systemic inflammatory uh, syndromes and could be suggestive of um, sepsis, right? Yes, fever, tachycardia. Um, we don't have a blood pressure, but if we had a blood pressure, that, that would help us. And, you know, even though he has shortness of breath, he's satting okay at 95, so that plays a little less. Um, but, you know, and, and then other things I, I would look in, in the eye exam to see if there's any jaundice, any paleness, uh, how the, if, if, the, uh, if, if the, um, the, mouth, the, the mouth has moist mucosas or not, uh, do I have a JVP? So looking for signs of dehydration. Um, and I will see that reflected on his chemistry. I, I would see that he either has hyponatremia or, or metabolic alkalosis or something like that that will tell me how bad this diarrhea is in, 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 in and it's supportive, right? Um, bilateral decrease in breath sounds um, doesn't tell me much. It could be atelectasis. It's just not telling me exactly that you have a rip growing pneumonia. Still, you still can have lichulena. Uh, it is part of, of, of that syndrome. And um, the mild tenderness to the left lower quadrant, you know, the patient had diverticulosis, this goes with that, um, but it can also go with these enteric um, organisms. So that's, that's how I, I will start putting the case together. Awesome discussion. Um, I would now give you um, the third aliquot. So um, starting with some labs, um, the hemoglobin was 13.3 um, and white blood count was 3,200 and um, with um, a, a lymphopenia, so lymphocytes are um, 6% and the platelet count is 67,000 and um, he has a sugar of 171 um lactate is 1.93 um uh, pro procalcitonin is 4.39 they um also performed the urine analysis which showed a subnephrotic range proteinuria so it was um 500 milligrams per deciliters and we also did some infectious workup for um hiv Influenza A and B, Mycoplasma and Legionella, which came out uh, negative. And we also did some stool studies and these were also negative. Um, I also have some chest imaging. Would you want me to stop here or also give you the chest imaging? Um, do we do we have a creatinine? Do we have a sodium or anything like that? No. Okay, because so so the reason again is you want to know if the patient is dehydrated or not. Um, and then the lactate cutoff for you guys is at 1.2, 1.4. It's not standing here. It is one here. It was just mentioned that it's a 1.93 millimole per liter. Okay. So, yeah, so sometimes just knowing the value, um, you know, could be. Um, yes, and, and as, as Hans said, you know, uh, sodium legionella, yes. So in patients that have shortness of breath and fever, their sodium will be tanking at 120, 124. That is a sign of, 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 of legionella. But we have, we have at least some of the major things have been negative. Um, now, stool studies, was that a PCR or a culture? Um, I guess it was PCR, but we didn't uh, quite say much more about it. Okay. All right. And did they send a stool culture or, or was just that um, uh, that was the way it is? Um, it was, I feel like, um, I have to say, uh, it wasn't much more in detail said, so it was just mentioned that stool studies came out negative. Okay, and the day, um, the other thing is, um, um, were there any blood cultures? 
Yes, but um, the black culture uh, will come in the last of the quote. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So fair, fair. Let me let me go over the here. Okay. So we know that his HIV is negative. So um, it, you know they didn't tell us about if the patient uh, was on prep or not prep. Um, I imagine the HIV was antigen antibody. Um, if there's a question that this is acute HIV, you want to do an, a viral load um, to make sure that it's there. Um, so, as I said, um, the white count, he has leukopenia um, because the white count is between 4,000 and, and 10,000. Um, the other one is that you your hemoglobin is it's okay. Um, I don't know if it's dehydrated or not. Um, and imagine the platelets are, are also low. So he has a bicytopenia. So two of his lines are down. Um, that is consistent, you know, either with uh, an acute infection uh, that is overwhelming the system and, and, and kind of a little bit that if he has bacteremia, he has sepsis. So remember sepsis, you can have leukocytosis or leukopenia, and you can start using um, your platelets as, as part of going into DIC and things like that. Um, other thing that I would have asked in the chemistry, um, just because um, we're looking at water and diarrhea, fever and nausea, um, and, and, and it's an MSM, is that we do have outbreaks of hepatitis A and um, meningitis. So that's also other things that I would have liked to have. That. Um, but now we'll go to image. Okay. So um, now giving you um, something about the chest x-ray. Um, so... The chest x-ray showed infiltrates in the left mid-lung and right perihilar marks. Mm -hmm. And the CT chest without contrast showed um, multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules with hazy surrounding ground glass opacities and uh, plural effusions bilaterally. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also performed an ultrasound um, of the abdomen and also a CT abdomen with contrast. Mm -hmm. And the ultrasound showed um, several uh, cystic liver masses and the largest was measuring 3.6 centimeters on CT and 2.3 centimeters on ultrasound. And... Um, uh, and then, um, so it was mentioned that he was admitted in the context of a sepsis and community acquired pneumonia, and he was treated empirically with ceftriaxone and oral acetromycin. Mm -hmm. And um, I would stop here. Okay. All right. So, so definitely we still, you know, going with your, you know, less likely viral. Um, you know, on your differential diagnosis um, because of how sick the patient is, I am everything. So you have someone that, you know, we, we know that they're bacteremic and I guess the bacteria will be revealed. And so things that um, tell me about the bacteremia is that one is you have this pulmonary nodules. Um, and so they, they don't say there if the pulmonary nodules are on the periphery to think that these are embolic events. Um, so that's one of the things. Um, you know, um, the other thing is that, you know, even despite the, the physical exam that had bilateral decreased breast sounds, we do see that um, it had some infertility on the low, left middle lung and right and mostly left, middle, long, and a little bit of the right. Um, what is surprising, which didn't say, and, and, and the CT chest um, um, didn't comment, and, and, and sometimes it does go a lot, um, below, is if the CT chest looked at the cystic masses when they did, because when you do the CT, it still gets you a little bit of the liver, so sometimes you can see that. Um, so, um, you know, so, so then you have to start thinking, are there any red herrings? Okay, let's see. You have the images here. Okay, can you like, can you share the image and make it big so I can look at it? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so, 
So if you look at this, the, the, the nodules that they're calling, they are in the periphery. So again, you know, the patient, we know it has sepsis. We know that it's bacteremic. So you have to think, where does the bacteria go? So one is having nodules up and down. Um, I am surprised that there was no LFTs or no um, sodium or anything like that on someone that, that was this sick. Um, and so then the question is, and I saw in the chat is, is are there parasites that can give you this? So, so let's talk about this. And it's, this is more of a red herring um, because the way it's presenting a little bit. So when you look at, yes, so Valeria's right. You, you think of echinococcus, but when you're gonna see that, the cyst, you're gonna see pulmonary cysts and you're gonna see liver cysts, right? So you're just not gonna see cysts on one side and something else. Um, usually what we find in echinococcus, if there are more uh, granulosomes in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the lung, is that they will cough up this salty thing and this like white membranes when it breaks down. So it's like they cough up this like little balloon things. Um, in CT, they, they have different dysmorphic uh, ways, high disease, um, if they're granulomas or anything like that. And this doesn't exactly look, I mean, at least the chest x-ray doesn't look like a high disease. So, so what you have to think about right now is, is the, is the images giving you two different types of, of, of um, diseases or they're all part of the same syndrome? So one is what does it make more sense? So if you have someone with sepsis and bacteremia having pulmonary nodules and, and, and right middle infiltrates and pleural effusions makes sense, right? The, the cyst could be an incidental finding, right? And they don't say if the cysts are, do they have fluid? Are they, are, are they multiple abscess? They don't say if they're stranding around it. So you could say that the cyst doesn't, you know, that's a little bit more of an incidental finding that doesn't equate to the whole picture that you have right now. Um, the other thing is that, you know, you have this urinalysis that is in the subnephrotic range. And, and as I said, that is a little hard to tell on someone who is dehydrated. And so that's why I wanted to know about the creatinine and what was going on with the electrolytes to know if there was something else going on, um, you know, and that's, you know, that's information that you have when, when you order your tests. Um, and so let's see, uh, can we proceed to see what is in the lung? Well, yeah, hence you can. The problem is that they're in the periphery and they have a drive non-productive and we already have kind of, we're gonna know what it is because the cultures are positive, the blood cultures. So probably whatever it is, it's gonna come from the blood cultures. So the, the question here is what ties together? So we talked about the host, we talked about the syndromes. And so now you have to think what pathogen and, and syndrome and lab actually fits this whole picture. So that's the next step on how do you figure ID. So you now you have the host, we know that it's an MSM presented with an acute illness of three day durations that had fever and, and GI symptoms, right? Um, that's what it is. Um, we know that um, they're non-HIV. Um, they didn't tell us if they ate or anything. And then you have the syndrome where we do have uh, sepsis, uh, you have leukopenia, uh, you have a positive procalcitonin, which will go more with a, with a bacterial infection. And you also have things that can be excluded. So Legionella is one, if they did the PCR is pretty good about that. Um, it is not flu, it's not HIV. Um, and still studies can be do, do, do that something um, um, uh, I mean, I don't know what else in the stool studies because it just says stool studies. <laughs> so I don't know what that means. Um, and then you have an image that, you know, uh, corresponds to something that is bacteremic. You have the effusions, um, they're outside. Uh, you have the, the ground glass opacities, the bilateral pulmonary emboli, which goes to think that this is kind of more of an embolic event than anything. And then you have this red herring of the cystic liver lesions, which um, are like, you know, and then there you have this ultrasound mass with a heterogeneous 
mass, which is not well described, but it's not seen on the CT because the CT describes it as a cystic liver mass and doesn't show like a mass. Um, <coughs> so Jasmine asked if this can be candida. So candidemia um, can, is gonna be, the patient will be sicker and you wanna have some risk factors. So diabetes, immunocompromised lines, TPN, things like that, uh, someone who's on the ICU, but it's not gonna present three days without on someone being healthy. Um, so that is, so how do we approach uh, the cystic liver lesions? So first of all, you know, and this is where I, I like to see the images. I'm, I'm a visual learner, so I, I like to see the images to see what, what they look like. Um, so the cystic, so I would do an MRI of the liver. And the reason I like to do an MRI of the liver is when you look half patho uh, liver pathology, an MRI gives you more definition. It can get, tell you if it's an HCC, if it's a cancer, it, it defines you a little bit more. Okay, so here's the, you make it a little bit bigger. So, okay. So, so I don't, I would not call those where the arrows are kind of cystic. They, they, they for me, these are more, um, more heterogeneous masses, you know, um, it could always also be either a hematoma if it was a little darker, um, but a cyst is usually clear. So this is not what I would call a cyst. So then you say, well, this is where I would go down to talk to the um, radiologist and say, you know, can you walk me through this and, and, and show me other things. Could it be emboli? Yes, they could be definitely could be septic emboli. So that's so so what do we still have? So, you know, good old friend staff stays on the differential because staff, you know, can do many other things, can look like this, or they can be leukopenic and everything. But if we're going that this was a case report and things like that, staff is not going to make the case report because that's common. So thinking about, again, MSM infections, I would go, you know, um, Shigella, enteric pathogens, um, uh, Campy, those would be the ones that I, I would be looking for. So questions? The ultrasound, okay. The, I'm not so good at reading ultrasounds as CTs and X-rays. So um, I, the ultrasound said that there was a mass, um, you know, and I don't see the mass. I mean, except the arrows there is. Uh, Lydia is asking, uh, is, I guess it, it is a common PJP non-HIV. Actually, it's not. Um, it, PJP is mostly seen as a, it's a, it's a fungi, and it's mostly seen in patients with immunocompromised. So anyone with prednisone above 20, TNF-alpha uh, inhibitors, um, transplant, uh, bone marrow, as well as solid organ, AIDS uh, below 200, um, anything that is a um, depleting of the T cells, um, that's where you will see that. So, uh, so uh, uh, how common, yes, okay, yeah, how common, it's very uncommon on non HIV patients. It's less than probably 1%. Um, in, in medicine, nothing is an absolute, so you don't have 100% and 0%. <laughs> There's always a chance that something might pop up. Um, would aspiration of the cyst with cytology be conservation in these patients? Um, so it all depends on what the, the blood culture is. I mean, the blood culture can actually explain a lot of things if it's a septic emboli. Okay. Um, when we think of bugs causing liver cysts, which are the main ones do you think? Okay, so the main ones for cysts are echinococcus, uh, granulosums or hyatid disease, uh, or multi, uh, echinococcus multilocularis. Uh, you can have cyst, um, you know, sometimes from fasciolysis, uh, they will form abscesses. And so you'll have different um, um, levels uh, of, of air fluid levels. 
um, intermeva, but that's more of an abscess. Uh, and then you have what I call simple cysts, um, polycystic cysts, um, you know, and so before putting a needle on anything, before being um, um, aggressive, because if, if there's something that is you don't want there is I would give therapy and then repeat the CT or the MRI in four weeks and see how things are. Hey, an awesome discussion. Um, are there actually um, other questions? Otherwise, I would um, give some more information. So um, we also performed a TTE, which was normal. And uh, we also performed um, uh, some, uh, uh, um, C we did an, a CT brain, which was also normal. And uh, later his empiric antibiotics were switched to cefepim. And um, as, um, as you were asking for blood cultures, um, um, the, uh, the blood cultures um, grew some gram uh, negative rods. I won't tell about it, but what do you think of now? Yeah. So, yeah. So, again, you know, uh, as I said, something that has been emergent, um, you rule out, um, you rule out um, um, endocarditis by having a negative TTE, um, TTE. So um, not necessarily vivid. So we, we tend to do more uh, transesophageal uh, echocardiograms when we don't have good windows, uh, when we have prosthetic valve. The new guidelines coming out um, are trying to dissuade that not everybody needs a TE because the tea is very invasive and not everybody has, um, has access to it. Um, so I would, if, if he's a thin person, you don't have a lot of air, you have very good visualization of the valves, that, that would be good. And then they did what, you know, um, they did a thorough part of examining, making sure that there was no other embolize, um, you know, around, right? So they went up and down. So now we have um, gram negative rods. So we go down to what we talked about when you look at the differential, we already said that you, you could have enteric, right? So when you think of gram negative, you think of enterics. Um, Legionella is an atypical one. Um, so, you know, but we have a PCR that is negative. So Shigella, because of the risk factor of MSM, um, E. coli, still risk factor for because of MSM. Salmonellosis, um, yeah, it can be, um, but, you know, it's it's all depends if they're imported, um, if they had a gallbladder and they're like typhoid Mary that are a reservoir, so that still plays, it's a gram negative. So, you know, I mean, they call you, I, I would have gone to see the, the plate, uh, and there's a way to distinguish Salmonella and Shigella uh, because one produces sulfur and the other one doesn't. So Shigella has sulfur and Salmonella doesn't. Uh, Shigella, Shigellosis tends to be more, um, more watery diarrhea, uh, but you do can have some dysentery associated with that. And so sometimes it can be bloody, but we've seen that. Um, camp is another one that can give you watery diarrhea and still is a transmissible enteric. Um, those are usually are very hard to grow. They're gram negative rods too. So I, I would still stay with the enteric and things. Um, looking at the antibiotics, um, so, you know, he was admitted with sepsis, uh, community acquired pneumonia. We talked to, you know, say why that was in kind of a part. And, and so you have to think, you know, does cefepime cover all of this? So, or do I need something like a quinolone to cover, um, to, to, to know more about this, you know, and then go from there. Awesome discussion. So um, I will now reveal what grew in the blood culture. So um, on day three, um, in the blood cultures, um, the, uh, there grew um, pan-susceptible Klebsiella pneumonia. And the final diagnosis for this case was Klebs Klebsiella pneumonia invasive syndrome. So it was a monobacterial Klebsiella pneumonia pyogenic liver abscess complicated with bacteremia and 
septic pulmonary nodules. And um, what basically happened is that this patient was hospitalized for nine days and we did some CT guided liver biopsy that was um, also positive for pan susceptible uh, Clipsilla pneumonia and also atypical glands of necrosis and acute inflammatory exudate. And um, we didn't perform a, percut a percutaneous drainage. Uh, because um, due to the multilocularity and the uh, location. Um, and um, then um, we discontinued the cefepim and after nine days, um, um, he, he was scheduled for ceftri ceftriaxone uh, for four weeks. Yeah. So, so one of the things to know about Klebsiella pneumonia, and we had that on the, in the differential, is that Klebsiella, um, there, is, there is pneumonia, there is oxytoca, and now there is Klebsiella, uh, which was formerly known as an enterobacter cloacae. So one of the thing is um, Klebsiella pneumonia could have, especially when they're very sick, is what we have a hypervirulent um, um, stage. Um, and hypervirulent means that when you go to the lab and you put, you, you grab the, um, the loop and you pull it up, you have the string test and it becomes very mucinous. So yeah, string test, it's a string sign. Yeah. And so that's um, usually when we see um, another, you know, with Klebsiella ositoka, uh, the other one that we see, we see, um, and we saw this mostly in, in Taiwan, um, it was um, empyemas and, and bacterial abscesses that took a long time to, to do. Um, I, I would have probably treated the patient for four weeks until resolution of the abscess of the liver. And so here, I think another teaching point is that this is where you need to talk to the radiologist, right? They describe this as a cystic liver lesion. And so if you, you know, Google cystic, you'll see that it should be clear. And what you're seeing on the image was not clear. It, it had fluid in there. It was kind of heterogeneous. And so that goes again that, you know, the radiologist is going to give you an interpretation of what they see. It's like when you go to a you go to a museum and you, or you go to an art place and you see a, a painting, you are, in, your interpretation might be different like someone else's. So this is why you, you, you talk to your radiologist and just walk them through to make sure that this is exactly what it is, you know, and, and give them the possibility if there's no stranding, if there's an inflammation or things like that. Now, interesting is where he acquired the Klebsiella. So Klebsiella pneumonia, it's, it's, it, can be, um, it can be inhaled. Um, it also can be ingested, um, or, you know, so it is part of, of our GI tract. And so this does come back again to this kind of enteric, um, enteric gram negatives, you know, so E. coli, Klebsiella that we can see in our MSM population and in something that is an emergent disease. Um, the other good thing about this case is that it was pan susceptible. So <laughs> it's not an ESBL, it's not an MDR, it's like plain old susceptible bacteria, um, which, you know, um, um, would be. And then in this patients, you know, um, bacteremias, usually we treat it for seven to 10 days, but I, I because of, of, of how the pulmonary emboli or the nodules, as well as the abscess, I would have treated this person with four weeks. And if they want to do a pick line, I would have done something like level fluxacin and then call it a day. All right, which, uh, so uh, uh, Jasmiran said, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, what is emergent in MSM? They are, these are not STDs. No, they are not sexually transmitted diseases. Um, actually, um, uh, as a disclosure, I'm giving a talk in, in, in Mexico about uh, emergent infectious diseases in MSM. So um, hepatitis A, is one, not everybody's vaccinated against hepatitis A. So that is one, uh, it is fecal oral. Um, then you have enteric, and those would be the ones that you see are seeing more and more. Um, and then of course, 
monkeypox, which is not considered an STD yet. Um, which are the typical hosts you think of Klebsiella? So, you know, so there are, there is the classic one that comes in your boards uh, and your steps is the jelly current one. You know, you're coughing up and, and this is usually an alcoholic who swallow their tooth or something and have, makes an abscess and they're coughing this jelly current. And if you, you don't know what jelly current is, it looks like strawberry. I didn't know what jelly current was, but it looks like strawberry. So it's kind of hemoptysis with mucus. Um, patients that have no spleen, um, Klebsiella has, uh, um, has um, a mucinous capsule around it, just like strep pneumo. So even though we don't vaccinate, we, we usually vaccinate people without a spleen for strep pneumo, Neisseria, meningitis, and Haemophilus influenza, Klebsiella is another one that you that gets filtered out through the spleen. And so we will see this in patients who have non-functional spleens. So cirrhotic patients are another one. So again, is, is the, is the liver not working correctly? That would be so alcoholics, cirrhotics, explenic, um, those are the ones. And, and then we are, you know, after E. coli, Klebsiella comes to be number two in UTIs and, um, and pneumonias and things like that in the hospital. Um, so, so it's it's a uh, ubiquitous and it's a uh, what I call a uh, it's a very diverse bacteria. It doesn't choose and pick their hosts. Oh, something happened. Can you still can you still hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I don't know my screen. My screen left, so I don't know um, if you can repeat me the last question because that I, I somehow lost the yeah. screen. Sure. Um. So um, another question would be when we think of liver abscesses, um, which box do you think uh, of typically? Yeah. So on liver abscesses, I I so so one of the things I look at the liver. So I said multiple livers or single, uh, multiple lesions in the liver for abscesses or a single lesion. So single lesion, what I think typically is gonna be amoeba, 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 and to prove it otherwise. Um, and that's just from, from how, it, how it works. Um, multiple lesions, uh, embolics, people being sick, uh, you think bacterial. So. Um, one of the things is that he had left lower quadrant, so likely how this patient, going back to the question I asked, how did he acquire? He probably had another diverticulitis, that kind of rupture, and then he became bacteremic because he had left lower quadrant. So if we put this together, acute disease, left lower quadrant, clepsialis in our stomach, and just went everywhere. So um, more thinking that this was an introduction because of, of lifestyle. Um, so if I have multiple abscess, gram-negative bacteria, um, streps, anaerobes, those are the normal. Uh, treatment of choices are usually ceftraxone and metronidazole, metronidazole for anaerobes. Um, if you don't want to use metronidazole, you can use Clinda, um, but just remember it doesn't get the bacteroides. Um, so things that are in the GI tract that will track to the, to the anapsis. Staph, strep can make give you abscess, so those are always in the part. Um, if you have cirrhotic patients and they are more prone for streptococcal diseases, and so they can, you know, have like a cellulitis, bacteremic, and have abscesses in the liver, right? Um, so those are kind of the um, the bugs. As I said, more exotics, you know, the amoeba, the hydratic disease, uh, we, we do have schistos and fasciolas and things like that. Um, and what should we be aware to check in Klebsiella pneumonia with respect to other organ manifestations? This is an unusual case, uh, but he was bacteremic. So again, I think he had the, you know, he had the diverticulitis, had been brewing, and by the time he showed up, and that's when he felt that it was worse. 
Um, so any bacteremia, you always want to, you know, do a pen scan. Uh, you want to make sure that they're not, you, you know, you did your TTE that was negative. You, you look at your brain, sets, chest and, and abdomen, and, and that help you. And, and the question is, is, if that's all negative, then you can treat this for seven to 10 days. We're treating infections shorter is better. So less is better, not more. No more is better. So less is better. Um, so bacteria, gram negative bacteremia. So we're going down to seven days. Uh, pneumonias we're treating for five days. Hospital acquired pneumonias, ventilator associated pneumonia, seven days. So a lot of the this this long treatments have been shortened to you know um, kind of like what you can count on your hand. Um, Lydia asks, uh, looking at the acute presentation of symptoms in this patient. What is the incubation period for Klebsiella to cause the syndrome? Well, so if we assume, Lydia, that this patient had diverticulitis, the question would be asking the patient, when did he start feeling sick? I mean, he, he started, he says three days, but usually probably he had some prodrome some days before with some pain. Um, and then the other thing is that um, it, it depends on the, on your bacterial load. I mean, obviously he had enough of a load to cause sepsis and that can take hours. Um, gram negative sepsis, remember are usually the most, uh, uh, I guess the more, um, they have the highest mortality because of the LPS. They activate LPS and turn. So you, you can deteriorate very quickly in hours. So um, I don't think he was brewing this for many days, uh, but he probably had one or two days before with feeling some left lower quadrant pain and he didn't pay attention to that. But then he became septic, you know. So... Um, Dr. Leider, thank you so much for coming. I have to say, uh, you have given us such an amazing infographic about Klebsiella and in general, the overview also, also seeing how you uh, made the framework of how he got this bug and how it caused it. I know have also a much better insight uh, what was actually the etiology uh, causing it. And also wanted to say a huge thanks uh, from Rafa's side. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't join because he's um, joining the Internal Medicine Open House and he's also um, <laughs> in, saying so much gratitude. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much for coming and we're always looking forward to have you with us. And I would now um, lead the way to um, Mukund um, for his uh, teaching points. Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, there were so many teaching points in this session that I couldn't fit all of them into my spot. So we're going to tackle some of the highest yield ones today, starting with a discussion of a, a differential differential diagnosis between people who are returning travelers and present with fever versus people who don't have a history of travel and present with fever should consider a pretty different diagnosis set for each of those things. We move on to a, a really wonderful differential for uh, dyspnea, fever, and GI symptoms as a clinical syndrome, uh, with bacteria and viral etiologies as being most likely. Uh, within the bacterial subset, we talked about Legionella, Campylobacter, Salmonella, E. coli, Klebsiella, which came up right at the beginning, congratulations, uh, and Shigella. We should always include strep pneumo and staph, although in this case, those two are less likely for a variety of reasons. On the viral side, norovirus comes to mind as the most likely, and we also threw out entamoeba or amoebiasis as a parasitic cause of these symptoms. Uh, given that this patient was MSM, we should consider, consider Shigella, Campylobacter, and entamoeba in particular. Moving on to the physical exam, uh, we were able to highlight the importance of checking for hypovolemia and dehydration by measuring things such as the jugular venous pressure. We didn't have a blood pressure in this case, but looking for mucous membrane dryness and skin turgor, as well as signs of jaundice given the uh, liver involvement. Uh, there was a great pearl about diarrhea history here. This was great for me to learn. Um, thinking about how many bowel movements this person is having in a day and how much they're going can indicate where in the gastrointestinal tract that diarrhea is coming from. That was a great pearl. 
we moved on to talking about uh, bicytopenia in the uh, lab findings, uh, in this case, a deficiency in red blood cells and platelets, which is consistent with an acute infection may indicate sepsis. Uh, we talked about procalcitonin as an, a new finding for me, a lab level, a precursor of calcitonin that can be an early marker of bacterial infection and sepsis. Really cool teaching point. And then we moved on at the end to talking about a couple of bugs that may be responsible for liver involvement, although we did determine in this case that what we're seeing on the imaging findings may not necessarily be cysts as those should have clear areas in the center. But we talked about echinococcus granulosus, which is a cestode or a tapeworm that presents with pulmonary and liver hydatid cysts causing hydatid disease. We talked about fasciola hepatica, which causes fasciolysis. Uh, as, a, as a trematode or a fluke, which is transmitted by uh, eating contaminated water plants and primarily presents with liver findings, since the liver and the biliary tree are where this bug matures during its life cycle. And lastly, we come to the, the diagnosis for today, Klebsiella, which is a gram-negative lactose-fermenting rod found in most people's enteric systems. And we think that this person might have become infected as a consequence of diverticulitis and potential diverticular rupture. Thank you, everyone. This was such a wonderful case. Thank you so much, Mukun, for these superb teaching points. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Laila. Do you have some um, wor words as a conclusion for today? No, thank you. It's a, it's a great case. It's a kind of, a, um, you know, it, it kind of walk you through different things. And um, I, I would add on your pearls that, you know, if you're Images don't match what the radiologist report says. Go and talk to your radiologist. Because <laughs> I think <laughs> it's a little bit of a red herring. They, they continue calling it a hydatid uh, cystic lesion when it was it was an abscess, you know. So, uh, you know, that's, that's you know, we, we work with uh, our colleagues. It's always an integral part. Um, you know, it's, it's a great case. Uh, it's something that we see often, yeah. Thank you so much. And... Um... Also, ah, uh, Deborah, thank you for the uh, amazing scribing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I would now stop the session. So, hope, um, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for coming, and hope to see you all again. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>